Okay, and we're recording. Um, and we'll have time for questions. You can put any questions that you have in the Q&A um, and we'll go from there. Okay, so today we're gonna talk about what is CIEE. Um, we'll go over the program overview. Um, uh, sorry, Teach in Spain program overview. We'll meet current teachers on the program and hear about their experiences. And then we'll have time for Q&A um, with those teachers as well. My name is Lauren Massey. I'm the Teach in Spain coordinator for um, CIEE. Um, and we'll, um, CIEE, we're a nonprofit that's been around for more than 75 years. We do programs for high school abroad, gap years, study abroad, first year abroad, um, but ultimately getting people, oh, and teach abroad, of course, um, but getting people um, experiences um, going overseas and also um, working with people inbound who are coming from other countries to work in the U.S., um, but they've been around since just right after World War II. Um, like I said, I'm Lauren Massey, your Spain advisor, and then also, Rachel, do you want to introduce yourself here on the call as well? Yeah, my name is Rachel Dietz, and I am a CIE TEFL advisor. Um, I think the most notable part about myself is that I also did the CIE Teach Abroad program in Madrid, um, so I'm super excited to, to be here with you guys today um, and to share my experience as well as hear other experiences of other people on the Teach in Spain program. Yeah, and then also we have Marisol on the call too. And Marisol, do you want to introduce yourself? She's one of our staff at CIE too. Hi guys, uh, I am Marisol Ruiz and I'm the program assistant for the Teach Abroad programs. Nice to meet you all. Well, thank you. Okay, so um, I'm going to launch a poll. I just want to get some information from everyone who's on the call, but have you been to Spain before? you can answer in the poll. Okay, so looks like almost 50-50. Actually like almost exact. So well, yeah, about half of you have been to Spain before and half of you have not. Very cool. A lot of people have, a lot of people haven't, but it's a good way to, you know, lots of people have studied abroad before in Spain, or maybe they did want to study abroad and COVID canceled it, or they want to have access to living in Europe. Um, we get people from all over the place. Okay, also, why do you want to, um, going back, why do you want to go and teach in Spain? I'll have you answer that. Okay, so um, also looks pretty even split. People want to learn Spanish, they want to do something different, travel around Europe, gain professional experience. It looks pretty, pretty even there as well. And then I'm going to ask you, do you know what TEFL stands for? Let me see if I can launch that. Did that one work? Rachel, can you see it on your end? Okay, no, never I mind. Can't see it. Rachel, what does TEFL stand for? It's broken on my end. <laughs> TEFL stands for teaching English as a foreign language. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> And do you speak Spanish or do you want to learn Spanish? So I'm going to ask, oh, these polls are not working now. How about raise your hand? You can raise, use the raise your hand feature if you can, if you speak Spanish. Here we got, it. let's see, looks like about half, half of you speak Spanish almost, cool. 
And what was your major in college? Okay, well, my poll's not working anymore. <laughs> but anyways, I wanted to know what your major in college is and then if you have previous teaching experience. Usually the answers for this are like 50-50. We see a lot of people who have education degrees and then we also see a lot of people who have degrees in the sciences or um, law or like, you know, uh, pre-med, things like that. So really we get people from all over the place um, in all different kinds of fields. Sorry about my broken poles. It worked for a little bit. Anyways, um, going over the eligibility to teach in Spain, you do have to have native level English proficiency. You have to have citizenship and a passport in, from the US, Canada, or Ireland, um, a bachelor's degree in any field. Um, if you're graduating this upcoming spring in May or June 2024, that's fine. You'd be eligible. You'll just need to have proof um, that, like a letter from your school saying that you're graduating in the spring. Um, you'll also, of course, have to have a positive attitude, be flexible, adaptable, and ready to like go and live in a new country, and then also be under the age of 59. We have different option um, choices for the CIE program. Our regular Teach in Spain program, um, you just go sometime in September for orientation and you start teaching in October. Um, and then we also have immersion options. So you can do a two or four week immersion program, which would mean for those two or four weeks, you would stay in a homestay and do a few, like three or four hours of Spanish lessons per day. Um, you get some meals provided, um, but that's a good way to get to Spain a little bit earlier and have an immersive experience and live with a host family. You can also get TEFL certified if you want to. Um, and then also, if you do get TEFL certified with CIEE when you're on the Spain program, you do get a discount as well. Rachel, do you want to talk about the TEFL options? Yeah, for sure. So um, there's two main options that I recommend for folks that are going to teach in Spain. Um, first and foremost is our 150-hour TEFL certificate. Um, this is mostly because um, the 150-hour TEFL certificate is internationally recognized and valid for life. Typically, international employers will want you to have at least 120 hours or more for that recognition. Um, it is true that you get the $195 discount on that course, and it's pretty comprehensive, right? So if you don't have prior teaching experience or you're looking um, to start off on the right foot with your teaching um, job when you're in Spain, this is really the best route to go. Um, the second option is the 60-hour TEFL certificate. Um, so it doesn't really meet those international requirements, but it does cover all the basics that you would need to know, um, particularly for the teaching role in Spain, right? So, um, you know, the basics of classroom management, lesson planning, um, all things like that to, to be a language assistant are covered in this course. And so um, if you're interested in leveling up um, and preparing for the teaching role itself, um, the TEFL course is really the best way to go. Thank you. Okay, and then about the job, um, the job is uh, 16 teaching hours a week. Uh, you might be in your school for more than 16 hours a week, but just in the classroom, it should be about 16. Um, and then you get Mondays or Fridays off, so you'll always have three-day weekends. And there's also lots of holidays in Spain. Uh, you get 1,000 euros a month, and then placements are all over the region of Madrid. And you're also a classroom assistant, so there should be teachers in your classroom. Um, you'll be an assistant teacher. You'll be placed in public or vocational schools with age ranges of zero to 18. Um, and some of your responsibilities will be cultural presentations, activities and games, um, conversational skills, working in small groups, and then also helping students um, study for English exams. In the public school system, you could also be teaching other subjects in English. So it could be like art, history, science, PE. Um, basically, in the public schools, they'll be learning everything in English as well. So you could be teaching uh, multiple subjects. OK, so now we'll meet the panelists. Cher, would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I am Cher. I came to Spain in August and I am here until June. And I also did the two week immersion as well as the, the TEFL certification. Um, I was born and raised in New York. Um, I moved to Florida when I was a teenager. I went to a small community college uh, there in Orlando. 
on my free time, I have loved to run, um, actually signed up for a half marathon in Sevilla um, next month. I also like to read books. Um, I'm living closer to my school, so I'm living in Alcala, which is about 40 minutes north of Madrid. And I teach to children between ages of three and 11. And I, of course, got TEFL certified just to open up new opportunities for me. Well, thank you. And good luck with the half marathon or marathon yeah. or half yeah. marathon. It's a half. It's a half. half. So, awesome. So, <laughs> so cool. Caitlin. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay. My name's Caitlin. Um, I have been here since September. Um, I did also did the TEFL certification before I came. Um, I had never studied abroad before. Uh, I went to school for international relations but ended up not going to law school. I was gonna use it for law school and I ended up teaching. Um, I just kind of found my way into the teaching profession. So I was a special education teacher in the States for about five years. Um, and then the state, so I'm from Indianapolis, Indiana and Indiana no longer allows you to stay on a teaching permit if you didn't go to school for it. So I decided to go to Spain and teach here while I'm also in school going back to get my certification in special ed. Uh, so that's what brought me out here. Plus also I've always wanted to travel um, and I haven't had the opportunity. So uh, this has given me that opportunity since we get a longer weekend here with only working four days. Uh, some of my hobbies, um, I'm a bartender and a mixologist back in the States. I can't do that here in Spain because um, that takes away a job from someone from Spain. So I can't do it here, but I do enjoy doing that. I like to do yoga. I like to hike. And there's a lot of opportunities to do that here in Spain. Um, and then I teach about an hour and 15 minutes by bus out of the center of Madrid in a town called Daganzo. Um, and then I live in a small village, a pueblo called um, Cobeña. So yeah, and then I oh, and then I did the TEFL certification because it's something that will add on to uh, like when I go back to teach in the states, it's something that I can use when I go back to the states. Cool, thank you, Grace A. We have two Graces on the call. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Grace. Also, um, I was born in New York City and raised in New York City. Um, I graduated from a small school upstate from New York, which was like about two hours um, from New York. I have an inclusive education degree, which is I'm certified to teach first through sixth special education and general education. Um, on my free time, I love to run, um, hike, and I love photography. So I hope to, and I already have seen my opportunity to do that here. So I hope to continue that. Um, I previously taught second grade in New York and I've always wanted to travel and teach abroad. So that's why I'm doing this program now. Um, but now I'm also currently teaching in Hatafe, Madrid at a bilingual school. I teach mostly third grade, but also second and first and five-year-olds sometimes. Mm -hmm. Um, it really depends. You kind of have to be flexible. Um, but like I said, I didn't, um, get the opportunity to study abroad. So I'm really happy to have the opportunity now. Well, prepare for some deja vu because we're very similar. Um, <laughs> my name is also Grace. Um, I have the same exact, believe it or not, went to the same college and I have the same exact major. Um, I also taught in the United States. <laughs> um, so I don't know if you can tell, but we decided to do this together, which I feel really fortunate. Um, we actually didn't go to the same orientation though, um, which is a whole nother story, but it ended up working out. Um, so yeah, I'm actually also the social media ambassador for CIEE. So you might've seen my face on Instagram or TikTok. I uh, graduated from SUNY Cortland and uh, also a teacher, like I said. On my free time, I love to go on walks, read, hang out with friends, and try new restaurants, which there's plenty of here in Madrid, so I'm very fortunate of that. Um, I also teach in Hitafe with Grace, um, although I'm usually in the lower levels, so I'm in more infantile and second grade. Um, I also didn't get the opportunity to study abroad in college, so this is the perfect um, mix of both getting teaching experience and travel. 
Okay, thank you. And we also have Olivia. She's one of our panelists, but she's having some internet issues right now. So she might be here. She might be not. But yes. that's just what happens. Oh, there she is. Yay. Yes, hi. <laughs> hi, Olivia. Sorry. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Hey. No, I was going to say part of being in yes. Spain is being flexible, right? Yes. Um, okay. So I'm Olivia. Um, I did the Teach in Spain four-week immersion, which was so amazing. And then I also was TEFL certified over the summer. Um, I grew up in a small town in Virginia. And then I also went to college in Tennessee. And then I did the last two years as a Teach for America core member in Nashville, Tennessee, where I got my master's in teaching. Um, so I am doing a new program for the community of Madrid. So two days a week, I am lesson planning. And the other two days a week, I'm in two different schools. And I'm kind of like the lead teacher teaching English lessons. So these are fully non-bilingual schools. They have never had oxes before. So I'm their first ever um, experience with an American, which is really cool. Um, and then I decided to get TEFL certified because this is my dream to teach in Europe. And this is kind of just like, hopefully my first year before forever. So yeah. Well, thank you. And also Rachel and I were wondering where you got that dessert. Um, a crazy place in Gran Via that there's actually a churro underneath that, if you would believe it. Um, it was like a stuffed churro with Nutella and we that's all we thought we were getting. And then it came with all of the whipped cream and, and Oreos and everything. And it was five euros. It was a steal. Share it with nice. someone, though, because it will give you a stomach <laughs> ache. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you. OK, so thanks, everyone. So now we're going to hear from our panelists again about just some more topics that we get lots of questions on. We know everyone always has tons of questions, and it's better to hear from people who are actually there teaching in Spain. Um, so we'll talk about saving and budgeting, housing and public transportation, part of those things about living in Spain, and then also, of course, the job teaching TEFL and then also private tutoring how to make extra money. So we'll start with savings for Spain. We're going to talk about um, budgeting, how to save, and just kind of planning. So um, we're going to have Cher start, and then I'll just have a, we'll just go in order with names. If you can just talk for a few minutes on your kind of experience. Mute. <laughs> saving um, for Spain and budgeting. My advice to everybody on this call is to save as much as you possibly can before you arrive in Spain because it is crucial because there is so much to do here in Spain and everything is very affordable. So you want to be able to have the money that you need to get your apartment, to get your phone up and going and stuff like that in addition to sp your spending money that you're going to want to need. So making sure that you have a cushion and then some to get you through um, and to keep you afloat. Um, and so, and then what other sort of expenses do I need? Did anybody else want to talk about that? And add to that? Yeah, I can, I can talk about that. So, I mean, my, I'm a very type A person. So I have a spreadsheet where I track every single thing that I spend money on and I have it into a category of like, housing, groceries, um, travel, et cetera. That's really helpful for me just to kind of make sure I'm budgeting that a thousand euros properly. Um, but I mean, the most common ones, Cher kind of touched on housing. When you get here, you're gonna have to do like any apartment anywhere, you're gonna have to do kind of like a one month's rent down payment sort of thing. Um, your phone bill, uh, your gastos, your utilities, which are very affordable compared to the United States, which is wonderful. Um, and then your public transportation card, which varies depending on your age. So um, everything else is kind of your call. Um, groceries are very affordable as well. And I would say give yourself, um, like Cher said, lots of cushion just in the first mm -hmm. month or two. You're going to want to have time to kind of figure it out and gauge how much money you're spending here and there. And then um, you can really get settled and feel comfortable, I would say, after like a month or two. Um, to kind of go off of what you both said as well, um, in terms of like saving initially, um, you aren't getting paid for the first month. So to two kind months. of for the first two months, sorry, mm -hmm. so to kind of, um, also have that cushion, you're going to want to have extra money saved. So if you plan on booking trips, which most of us said that we want to travel within the first months or in 
our goal is to travel, you're going to want to have money saved. So in order to book those trips and have money to have a cushion while you're traveling, you're going to want to have like extra money saved, like I said. Um, and honestly, for me, it was hard for me to budget and even realize like how much I really needed to have saved until it's halfway through the month. <laughs> and I feel like I'm kind of drowning a little bit. But it's kind of like it goes along with the fact that you need to be adaptable and be flexible and just realize like I can't I need I can't go out every single day. I can book this trip, but I also need to like cut back a little bit. So it's kind of like just being open to understanding where you're starting and then <laughs> saving and then where you are going to end up. Um, so just come prepared with money saved and budget initially. Yeah. There's a question in here, um, which I think, you know, it comes down to saving before you go, but I mean, it, it says it seems like a thousand euros is not, is, or it's a, it seems like a thousand euros is enough only for rent and utilities, but not enough for fully living and traveling. Is there any leftover money for travel or does that all come from savings? Um, does anyone want to answer on that? I can answer on that. It come, For me, it comes from my savings. Um, I guess, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I could say, so it really depends on where you're living and how much you're willing to spend on your living. So for example, Grace and I, we spend about 400 euros. So we still have 600 euros to spend on traveling and groceries and all those other types of things. So I think it's... Um, kind of managing like what your your, major, priorities. your priorities are for us we have a good apartment but it's not extravagant mm -hmm. it's what we need so if your main goal is to travel then maybe cut back on where you're going to live um so I would say that a thousand euros for us is manageable in terms of what we're hoping to do and what we are getting out of our apartment Okay, cool. And then I'm just going to look at the money related questions right now, and then we'll get through all of them. But um, how much do you typically spend per week on groceries? I, I you got it. I, I want to hear from I both spend, of you. So. Okay. <laughs> um, I spend between 30 and $50 a week on groceries. That's about same for me. I really like to cook and I would rather eat in and then go out for special occasions um and because i have so much food around like i can do that whenever so trying really hard to save money one way of saving money is you know getting groceries and cooking for yourself so my budget for groceries every month is about 150 and that's proved to be perfectly fine yeah. okay um so we'll talk about tutoring more, but do you feel like um, do do you feel like you have to tutor or do um, an extra side gig for more income to have the life that you're like you know to be able to fund your life or how many of you tutor? I don't tutor. One, two, three, four. So four of five of you, which is so eighty percent. But you said you don't share. No, I do not. Okay, but four of you do, and do you feel like that helps? Yeah, I tutor every other week um, just for one family. I would like to maybe have another one just because um, with my particular job, I'm only working with students two days a week, but I also put up dog walking flyers in my neighborhood. So hopefully someone wants me to walk their dog. Um, and <laughs> I also just really miss my dog. And so I would love another way of hanging out with dogs and making some extra money. But I kind of use my tutoring and money as... Like if I wanted to go out to eat, um, that's kind of like an extra positive. Cool. Okay. Um, there's a lot of good questions in here and I'm going to get to them, but I think we'll just move on and we'll go, we'll kind of go back and forth a bit. Just we'll move on to the next one and I'll come back to some questions later. Um, let's talk about housing. So we'll have Grace start, um, the, the other Grace, and we'll talk about costs of housing, um, neighborhoods, how to find places, furnished, unfurnished, how long it took you. Go for it, Grace. 
So my experience was super fortunate. Like I said before, Grace and I didn't arrive at the same orientation group. So while I felt grateful that like I knew who I was this I was living with ahead of time. Meanwhile, we were also open to like gaining roommates. Like you have to be extremely flexible. It's like if I found an apartment of if that's a four bedroom and I was able to get it in our budget in a good location, we would have found two extra people. But so having that um, consistency in the back of my mind of somebody I knew who I was living with was nice, but everything else I kind of was in the same boat as many people are like kind of doing that on my own. So um, my cost of rent, like Grace said, is around 400, like 430. And then um, for utilities, it's different for everyone, but we end up usually paying with Wi-Fi and like gas combined, probably like 25 a month, maybe that, like it all depends on how much electricity you use and how frugal you are. And like Grace kind of mentioned before about our apartment, um, we really do do uh, try and save any way we can. Like our sh- chandelier that we have in our living room, we only have two light bulbs screwed in. Like we're doing everything we can to save on our electricity bill. But that's because we try and prioritize other things. So when looking for my apartment, um, I used Idealista. That was kind of the app that was most recommended to me. And if I have one tip about that app, um, it's that the feature that is on there is you can automatically message someone um, right through the app and send like what would be like an automated or curated message. But those most landlords do not check those boxes or you'll get an automated message sent right back. Something I like to do is just look at the phone number and contact the landlord directly via phone call um, and uh, or WhatsApp message, because as soon as you're able to get that person on the phone and set up a viewing of the apartment, the sooner you're able to sign that lease. Talking to people over the phone via WhatsApp or email just elongates the process. And it, it's honestly much easier to get scammed that way. Um, so I was, like I said, fortunate. And I only it only took me about like a week, a week and a half to secure this apartment, but I wasn't picky. Um, I only have Grace as a roommate, but like I said, I would have taken on other people if it meant... I was able to find an apartment in the place I liked and um, your neighborhood is totally off of preference. So Grace and I school is about, it ends up being about an hour commute from where we live. But since Grace and I um, both agreed, we're only here for the year. We decided to prioritize living in the city center and kind of fully immersing ourselves in that experience. And um, at first the hour long commute was daunting, but we ended up really liking it. So um, we live in the Anton Martin area, which is like right on the one line. It's about like a 10 minute walk from Seoul. So it's definitely busy and like touristy, but I would almost compare it to living in like Times Square of Manhattan, where if you were only going to live in New York City for a year, like, don't you want to be around like all the hustle and bustle? That was kind of my opinion. Um, our apartment was furnished, uh, old furniture, but like we said, gets the job done. Um, and there's so many cheap, like random furniture, electronic places around here that you're able to get things for pretty cheap. Our TV and air fryer, we actually got as like a combo deal on Facebook Marketplace from an ox who happened to be leaving. So if you want, if there's not things in your apartment that you want, you're definitely able to get them. And most apartments come furnished with the basic things that you need. Sorry, that was like a lot. (laughs) Oh, it's good, good. Yeah, Caitlin, how about your experience? I know yours is a little different. Yeah, so I'm in my 30s. I'm 30. So I knew that I wanted to live by myself when I started to look. Um, I actually, I I was also very fortunate. I secured my housing prior to coming here. Um, I knew somebody that lived in Spain as a nanny. um, And he told me about this lady who had a furnished Airbnb that she does like long term contracts for. And so it ended up being only about, I don't know, it's like 15, 20 minutes to where my school is. So I got really fortunate, but it's 650 euros. It includes everything, um, Wi-Fi. It includes like Netflix and um, other like shows, like streaming services. Um, So no, everything's included in the 650. Um, I am very far from the center of Madrid. So it's about an hour and 15 minutes by bus to the center but I kind of prefer that I'm not someone who goes out a lot but I go in usually every weekend and meet up with people and that's not a huge huge deal to me Um, but I really like my town it's 
very small. So everybody knows everybody. You can walk within like 15 minutes to everything. Um, it's, it's a lot of, um, there's still a club in my little town. <laughs> it's called the jungle, which I thought was really interesting when I found out there was a club in this tiny Pueblo. Um, but, uh, I, so I, I guess I would suggest before I found out about my friend who lived here prior, I think that what I was doing mostly that I think was beneficial was looking at Airbnbs and then messaging those people, even if it wasn't a long-term contract and like, like messaging them and being like, Hey, like, would you consider doing a year long contract with me and see if they, you know, we'll say yes or no, and then kind of negotiate a price with them. I think depending on where you're at could depend on how much you negotiate that price for. Um, but that's what I was kind of doing in the beginning before I got lucky with, with this apartment. Um, but yeah, did I answer everything furnished and I live on my own? Yeah. So. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. So definitely like living alone, you will spend more living with roommates. You'll spend you know, it just depends on what your priorities are and how much savings you have. Um, cool. Thank you. Okay. Public transportation. So taking the metro, taking the bus. How about we'll start with Olivia this time, because I know you were just coming back from somewhere from tutoring, I think. Um, but why don't you talk about that? And also one question that we have is how much does it cost um, for public transportation if you're under 21? Or if you're, I guess, under 26, but if you are 21. Or are you under 26, Olivia? Yeah. Okay, yes. cool. You want to answer that question? Yes. So right now there's a sale, which is lovely. Mm -hmm. um, it's eight euros a month. And that gets me to all of the regions in Madrid. So there's different zones. Um, and essentially each zone out you go um, would cost more money if you are over the age of 26. So for me, it's universal one flat rate of eight euros for the whole month, which is lovely. Um, how I get to school. So because I go to three different places every week, that uh, is different every day. Um, but on Mondays and Wednesdays, I take uh, a metro and then I take a bus. And then on Tuesdays, I just take a metro to the very last stop on line five. And then on Thursdays, I'm also in Hatafe, same with the Graces on Thursdays. And so I take a Metro and the Circanias. Um, all of them, I do a little bit of a walk, but nothing crazy. And I quite enjoy the walk. Um, mm. Yeah. And then in terms of how I figure it out, my, the apps or the map app that comes with your phone is super, super helpful. Um, you can select what time you want to arrive and also what time you want to leave. And it will tell you the best uh, route to go from there. Um, it'll tell you if you should take a bus or take a metro or the Circanias. The Circanias, by the way, is the commuter train. Um, it's basically an above ground metro. Um, and that's super convenient. Just doesn't run quite as often as the metro does. Um, but yeah, I personally am such a fan of the bus, which I know is a really hot take. Um, but I really enjoy the bus. <laughs> I find the metro to be a bit toasty at times. Um, but yeah, everything's super easy. And I also like the Metro card, uh, the transportation card, I have it right here. You get your lovely photo taken on the back in your appointment. Um, but it can take you to a lot of the really beautiful cities outside of city center. So El Escorial and um, I went hiking a couple weeks ago and it was like a two and a half hour commute, but my Metro card took me there. So yeah, it's pretty, I love the public transit and coming from a very small town where we did not even have Ubers. This is really great. <laughs> sure, how about for you? Um, so how do I get to my school? I live closer to my school. So I literally seven minutes away, my school is around the corner. So I walk. Um, but I do have the Abono card as well because on the weekends I do go into Madrid. Um, it cost, I'm a little, I'm older, I'm in my 40s. So mine costs, my Abono card is like $32 every month. And I know I think because that, that's on a discount. And I take one bus, I take one bus down into Madrid. It's about 40 minutes. And then that takes me right to it's the, the Avenida de America interchange. And that takes me right to all the other trains. 
So I can just jump on any train and be, you know, further into the city center within within minutes. I really love the public transportation here in Madrid because it's super fast. It's like there's a train every six minutes and everything is completely walkable. So that's one of the best highlights of of Madrid. And I use the city mapper and I also use my Apple Maps on my phone and they're always accurate. They're always on time. And even if I miss a bus, it tells me the, the next time when a bus is coming or a train. So a breeze, a simple and easy is a breeze over here in Spain. They're also really clean, which I've yes. only been to New York City once, but I've heard, I've heard like and seen horror stories of, you know, nasty. <laughs> we can confirm. Nasty we weather. can confirm. Yeah. This is much cleaner, so, nicer, safer. Well. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Honestly, like even if you're walking too, the streets are very clean. There's always um, people cleaning things up. Yeah. And as I've been traveling and seeing other cities, Madrid's system for waste management is way better. Like there's trash cans on every single corner and so people are legitimately throwing their trash away so that's not transportation related but it's very clean <laughs> yes it's very clean and i feel very safe walking around in the streets of madrid very safe as a solo traveler okay cool thank you um and i think olivia there was a question for um the app that you uh that you were talking about for planning the routes for your commute. Do you want to type that into the Q and A? Yeah, it is. Or, it's literally just the um, Apple Maps that comes oh. with your phone, but I can oh. um, add that in there. Okay, awesome. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of different transportation apps. I think everyone has their favorites. Um, okay, now we'll talk a little bit about teaching. Um, how about we'll start with the graces this time and um, talk about your teaching experience and then we'll go on to share. Sure. So being coming from being a teacher in the United States, I didn't know what to expect, but I did have like some level of expectation of what would be expected of me and what the classrooms would look like and what the school environment would look like. And I would recommend if anyone has any form of educational background, it's definitely keep that in your back pocket, but it's nothing like America. Um, in my, our school, at least, the kids um, are... I wouldn't say like misbehave because that's not what I mean. I mean more that the school values uh, conversation, banter, and um, them using English as like much as they can over them raising their hand. So like if we were going to talk, kids in my school are like talking to each other, answering back to me. And if they're talking in English, it's pretty widely accepted because they rather them naturally talk in English instead of sit there, raise their hand and lose their train of thought, which I thought was very interesting. And that might just be in my younger grades and infantile. But um, the subjects that are taught in English in our school is they have an English class and then they have like a life science class. So they, um, my first graders are learning about the five senses in the human body and second graders are learning about invertebrates and vertebrates all in English, which is so cool because they don't even really know about that in Spanish yet. Um, and as far as like prep time go, we're primary, so I can't really talk on secondary, but as far as the prep time goes, we don't really do much to prep ahead of time unless it's a holiday or there's something we're doing specific that we'd like to do um, initially that is not necessarily expected of us. So like for holidays, what I've been doing is like for um, like uh, the beginning of the year, Thanksgiving, Christmas, I've come in with like a little presentation and like a recipe card of like different recipes that we do in America for different holidays or times of year. So like I'm from New York and in October, I introduced my kids to a bacon, egg and cheese. And then for Thanksgiving, I like give them mashed potatoes. Then for Christmas, like Christmas, like crackle desserts. And they loved it. They went home and they actually ended up making it with their families and sending in pictures. So that's like something I did as prep, but it's not, that was not even like asked of me. That was something I did like in addition because the kids like love hearing about American holidays, but not, there's nothing really expected of you. If you want to talk about dress code. Yeah. Um, um, so like Ray said, like if you are, if you're used to American dress and like going into a school and what you're typically supposed to wear, um, it's very different here. They're very more laissez-faire, like they're more comfortable they also want to want the teachers to be comfortable so you can go in wearing jeans or maybe like yoga pants and a nice shirt so it's really like it's a it's a little bit more chill here mm -hmm. um 
How many different teachers do you work with? We work with a lot. So during the day we have, it's, it's from nine to two and there's 45 minute periods that we go in and out of different classrooms. So we work with a different teacher each period for the most part. So for me personally, I work with probably like four different teachers. Um, and it's great because you get to meet all these different teachers and their different teaching styles and you just learn a lot as a teacher. Um, so I personally really enjoy getting the opportunity to work with different teachers and have that different um, opportunities to learn from them. Um, and I teach mostly third grade, which is really cool because I taught second grade last year. So it's interesting to see the crossover in third grade. Um, but also their third grade here is the age of second grade in America. So it's interesting to see what they're learning now compared to last year, what I was teaching. Um, so mostly third grade, but I also teach sometimes second grade, sometimes first grade, and then infantile, so five-year-olds. Um, and it's cool because- Even like two, even like three yeah, and four-year-olds. Like th all infantile is very, very interesting to, <laughs> to go into and um, to see what they're learning. I love them. But it's, <laughs> it's really awesome because they love you and- it's you feel really needed yeah. it's great um but for them mostly they're learning like colors numbers those basic things um but yeah well thank you and share how about your teaching experience well and um, there's only a little bit that i could add to the graces because i'm in primaria as well um, I also taught before coming here for the past seven years, but I worked with uh, pre-K, which is like four-year-olds. So I teach them as well here in um, Madrid. Um, I teach, in, well, I, mean, I just teach English, and I work with like about four teachers a day. So between the ages of three and four to sixth graders, which is like 11 years old here. And I do sixth graders like two days a week and then fifth graders to another two days a week. My prep time is two hours a week. So it's really just me asking the teachers what what I, what they want me to bring to the table. How much can I help them with their lessons and turn their their le lessons more into English? Um, dress code, like they have said, it's very lax. They want you to be really comfortable. Um, and I teach between three and six years old. And I taught, everybody's really really nice and everybody's really informal. Like they like the graces were saying, like they they encourage the talking amongst the students and as long as they're talking in English and things like that. So. That's a little bit different than what I'm used to in the States. The States is a lot more formal as far as dress code, dress code and walking in the hallways and things like that. But you won't, you won't see much of that here. Lauren, I don't know if we have time, but I- Yeah, go for secondary, it. If there are people who are interested. Yeah, yeah, no, I'd love to hear that. Yeah, it's, it's different in secondary. I'm gonna be honest. Um, I came from working in a high school in the States and then coming here, um, it is a lot of prep time for me, um, but there's breaks between my schedule throughout the day where I do that prep time. I do have to ask the teachers in advance, like what is it you need me pre to prepare for the next day? So I'm teaching history, global classroom, which is um, like model UN, which is a whole different like side of teaching. Um, I have English classes, I have art classes. Um, and so they ask you, each teacher will ask you to prepare something either for the whole class, for the whole like hour, or it might just be prepare like a game or an activity to do. Um, but it is a lot of, at least for me, it's a lot of prep time and all my other friends who are in secondary also have a good amount of prep time. I, I'm trying to think of like an average time that I spend prepping, but I don't know, maybe like three to four hours. Um, but I teach with, all my classes are a different teacher. So I have 14 classes out of 16 hours that we teach and I have a different teacher for each class. So, and I teach kids who are from like 12 years old all the way to 18. So it just kind of varies. Cool, thank you. That's good to hear the different kinds of experiences. Um, and private tutoring, how about Caitlin, you wanna talk about that and then we'll have Grace's go? 
Yeah, so I actually really like private tutoring um, and I don't just do it for the extra money. It is nice, the extra money, but it's just also nice to kind of vary the type of students I'm teaching. Um, so to start out, I created a flyer on Canva with like the little pull tabs and I put that up in my school. I put it up in my town that I live in in the little, um, the, like the community center. Um, and then I also let the teachers know at my school that I was interested in private tutoring. And so kind of by word of mouth, um, I have... Currently, I have eight kids that I tutor. I have three three-year-olds that I that I tutor for an hour all at once. And that's just like a lot of playing with them, like songs and like different activities, like, a, you know, colors and just like being in a band. Like we played band today. I had tutored them earlier today. Um, and then I have a couple kids who are around 12 years old. And I do do prep for those. Like for my older kids, I will do prep. So their parents will send me what they're currently working on in their like English class. Um, so we'll spend time doing a quick review over like the grammar forms and then I'll create like an activity or a game for us to practice. And then I usually spend like the last half hour just doing conversation skills um, and listening and speaking skills. Um, and then I also have a girl who's 18 and she's getting ready to go on to university. And so she's doing more of like test prep. Um, and so I just really enjoy like having that wide range of students. Um, it does add to my prep time on top of the prep time for secondary school, my secondary part, but um, I do really like it. I would say in terms of cost, um, it kind of varies what you can charge people. So like if you're traveling a little bit, I would charge more. So like people that I'm not private tutoring for in my town, I charge 20 euros per hour. And then for people who are in my town, I charge 15. So I'm making about 500 extra euros a month um, just from private tutoring. So I, I use that money for traveling and just anything kind of extra if I want to do on top of you know, it is nice. I, I do enjoy it. And I and I did work it out like you have to work out your schedule where I only tutor on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, because I have Mondays off. So that leaves me Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday to travel. And then I booked all of my tutoring in those three days, which it makes for a long day from like 8 to 8 p.m., but it works out. Well, thank you. And how about Grace's? What about your experience? Sorry, and I hope it's okay. I'm calling you the Grace's. Just it's everybody knows. Grace, Grace. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to go? Um, yeah, so I um, tutor like a few people as well. I had a similar experience to Caitlin um, through word of mouth, but mainly what I did was join a bunch of Facebook group chats where you just kind of like, uh, they're all called different things like Oxes in Madrid, tutoring in Madrid, English lessons, and, there, and there's a bunch. And you join them and kind of just give like a little blurb about yourself, your availability, and you can even put what you charge. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing that because it does vary, like Caitlin said, um, depending on each situation. And then you get um, reached out to by like families. What actually happened to me was that a teacher from a school reached out to me through the Facebook group chat. And then she had put my number in some other group chat. I'm not even really sure exactly how what happened, but I was just reached out to in multiple different facets on WhatsApp, Facebook, email, um, and set up different tutoring appointments. So I tutor um, one boy who's 12. I tutor one little girl who's six, um, no, eight. And then um, Grace and I tutor kids at our school who it's like a teacher at our school whose kids attend. And it's a group of five, uh, five-year-olds. And we flip flop each week who takes that on. But my prepping for tutoring for my six and my little, the little kids, it's a lot of like Caitlin said, games, um, puzzles, like get, just getting them to talk. And the parents just appreciate you talking to them in English because they only talk in Spanish at home. So when they are able to be exposed to that on a different level and on a more like intimate level than just school, they find that really valuable. And then for my, um, like the older kid I teach tutor who's sit who's 12, um, we do tar target more specific skills in English because he takes English exams. But um, I was just after Caitlin said, like how much she makes a month in tutoring, I was trying to like figure out in my own head how much I make. But I have to be completely honest with you, it's different every single month for so many different reasons. Like I tutor on Wednesdays, sometimes they cancel, sometimes I cancel. Like they uh sometimes we go away, sometimes there's holiday break, sometimes they go away. So like in a, in a perfect world, I probably make like 
could make 120 to honestly like $150 a month tutoring. But I haven't seen that yet because everybody's schedules changes. Nobody's perfect. So average, I'd probably make about like an additional 75 to a hundred dollars a month. But um, it, it varies because of my travel plans, their travel plans, people get sick, people have other um, obligations. So it's not as consistent, but I do enjoy it. Um, my experience in terms of finding my other um tutoring job, um, because I have two. I have the one with the five year olds, and then I also tutor two kids, a twelve year old and a six year old. Um, one for each hour, so the twelve year old for an hour, and then the six year old for an hour. Um, and I found I got this position through the CIEE big group chat. Someone had put out there that their previous teacher was looking for um, an English tutor and she put it out there and I messaged her and then I received this position. Um, so it kind of depends, like you could go on Facebook or you can go in the big group chats that are really awesome to be a part of. Um, so if you have the opportunity to be, join the WhatsApp groups, 100% recommend. Um, so that's how I got this position. Um, I don't, in terms of charging I originally put it out there that I was charging $20 per kid because oh, yeah. my travel was really far um I travel probably about 40 minutes to 50 minutes to just get there um so back and forth it could be a lot but they she was offering $15 15 euro per child and I honestly was looking for a tutoring position so I was willing to be flexible and take this position no matter what um, and honestly, like Caitlin said, I love it. This is, it's just so fun, like going into this um, Spanish home and being immersed in their culture and seeing how they learn and what they're talking about. And it's just, it's really fun because I kind of missed, it's not babysitting, but I miss being around children and just kind of like, not necessarily like in an education standpoint, but like rather just having fun. Um, so that kind of goes along with my prep for my six-year-old. I we're making this book all about her. So I'm getting her to write and I'm getting her to talk about herself in English. So that's fun for her, but it's also just the conversation with her in English. Um, and then for the 12-year-old, it's more like, um, just talking to him. We talk about his day and then we talk about his school and then we'll, watch videos together and we'll just have the conversation because he's very he's fluent in English very well so um my prep for him is more um quizzing and that kind of basis um I just wanted to say about charging because Grace brought up a good point we're like at coming from tutoring in America like you in America, you could charge upwards of like of sixty dollars an hour for tutoring and the average here um, talking to most of my friends is 15. Like some people get like $12 an hour. I only like the most I've heard really is 18 an hour for like any for like anyone the primary age. So that's also something to consider as far as like how far you're willing to travel to get there, like how much time you're willing to put in to make that money. Like it's $18 an hour, but it might take up three hours of your day. Um, but after school, it's kind of like, what else are you going to do? Like, you might as well go and do it and make some extra cash. So that's something to keep in mind too. Um, I also just want to make one more point. Um, we have a couple of friends that aren't, that weren't previously teachers. Um, they actually just graduated college or they were in the business world. Um, just in general, they weren't previously teachers. Um, and as a previous teacher, I was scared if I was even qualified to be able to teach or private tutor just because I they're Spanish and I don't know if like I'm going to be good at it in general but I would say don't be nervous it's the best opportunity and no matter what your American accent or wherever you're from and if you're fluent in English is perfect you're going to help them no matter what and just having that conversation is you're you're qualified Well, thank you. 
Okay, we'll move on to TEFL. I'm getting TEFL certified. So how about let's hear from Olivia first, and then we'll move on to Caitlin about um, your experience with the TEFL course. Yeah, um, I had a great experience. So I wanted to do it after I finished my master's. So I kind of like blended it one into another, which was nice because I was still in the school zone. Um, but it was a 10 week course. Um, I had class once a week and we would have assignments throughout the week that varied in uh, difficulty. You do not have to have a background in education to get TEFL certified. Um, I do think that it helped me, but helped more in the sense that I was maybe able to do the work a little bit quicker um, because I had experience with uh, similar assignments. Um, but I worked with students in Nashville who were not native English speakers. And so I had some experience working with students um, who are similar to students I'm working with here in Spain. Um, but I was given just like a wealth of information and uh, tips and tricks and lesson plans and also resources for designing lessons here in Spain, which has actually worked out super well because I'm doing the new program for the community of Madrid where I'm leading lessons two times a week. So it's been really helpful for lesson planning. And like the other panelists have said, like we don't have an extensive amount of planning time. And so I think the TEFL certification has really helped me um, become more efficient in my planning, which is nice. Um, and also just, this is gonna sound bizarre, but it's given me a lot more empathy for working with students who don't speak English because it's it feels a bit unnatural it's coming from somewhere in the US where everyone only speaks English. Um, it's just allowed me to work a little bit harder in forming those connections. And um, yeah, I really have enjoyed having the TEFL certification. And I believe um, Rachel said earlier, it lasts for life and it is international uh, internationally accepted. So um, if I wanna take my teaching outside of Spain um, to somewhere else in Europe or Asia, or Australia, uh, wherever, um, I could do that with my TEFL certification. So it was really quick. 10 weeks goes by really fast. Um, and in the grand scheme of things, 10 weeks in your whole life is very much worth it. So I highly recommend, um, yeah, I think that's it. Thanks, and Caitlin? Um, let's see, what can I add to that? Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the course. So yeah, 10 weeks did go by very quickly. And I think it was really beneficial. Even after teaching for five, four, four or five years, it was really beneficial. Um, I knew how to lesson plan, but I didn't know how to lesson plan for ESL students. Um, so that was very beneficial. Um, what else? I thought that my, the class is very small. There were only about 10 of us um, in my class, which I thought was nice because you got to really get to know the people in the class and then work really well together on the assignments. And then it, it is online. So you do like discussion boards and everyone, if you've taken an online class, you know how discussion boards can kind of be kind of boring, but, or just, you know, not really personal, but when you're in such a small class, like people really will like try to help you get better. So they go back and forth with more like beneficial feedback. Um, there, there were like, maybe 10 modules and at the end of each of the modules there was an assignment and then a final project um and like a quiz after each each module that you learned about and then one of the most beneficial things for me was receiving feedback from the people in my class so you would have to do like a um what do you call that uh rubric like a rubric from the teacher, you would get her feedback as well as the feedback from somebody in the class as well. So I thought that was beneficial, but I definitely recommend it. Um, I plan to use it whether I go teach in another country after this or whether I go back to the States, I'm gonna have that on my resume and it will last forever, so. Also just really quickly building off of that, not everyone in the TEFL program is going to Spain. And so it was really cool to be able to meet people who are teaching all around the world and like Caitlin was saying, to get their feedback um, as someone who's going to teach in something, a completely different uh, scenario, that was really beneficial. And also now I know people who are living in like South Korea and Thailand. So it's pretty cool to have made those connections, especially with the small class. Awesome. Um, and 
also oh, yeah. just for like being confident without getting certified I think it's just experience like when you get into a classroom it's just it, it, it's gonna happen you just have to be in the classroom so yes again in lesson planning I think it kind of helps if you've never lesson planned but the experience of actually being in the classroom that's what you're gonna learn the most from yeah, cool. no, I, I'd like to add something, Lauren, really quick about yeah, go the for it. Go course, for it. too. If you are looking for more community, we do have a Facebook group for students and alumni of the CIE TEFL course. Um, we absolutely adore all of our TEFL students and alumni. Um, and I know Belen and myself are based in Madrid, so we like to have meetups every now and then with our alumni to um, hear about their experience. Um, and to help connect you guys, um, you know, with other teachers um, and other opportunities that are out there. I know there's a question in the question box right now about, you know, what happens after teaching abroad. And so um, that's another big element to the TEFL course that we are really passionate about because, um, you know, getting TEFL certified is a time investment. It's a monetary investment as well. Um, and it's important that, you know, you're teaching in Spain now or you're going to teach in Spain with a TEFL certificate. Um, but there's a whole life after that, too. So, um, you know, we're, we we try to help connect you guys, um, you know, with a good community of uh, similar similar folks to you. Awesome. Thank you. I think we've completed the panel. So thank you for the graces and sharing, Caitlin and Olivia. Um, we'll have some questions. We do have some questions I want to get to, but Rachel, do you want to explain this? And we'll have them, because I've messed up all our polls, we'll just have them put their number in the chat. Um, yeah, feel free to, to um, you know, add up some of your points. I, I created this mini quiz. Uh, if you're curious on knowing if TEFL is right for you, it's not right for everyone. I mean, um, you are a language assistant after all in Spain. And so if you have prior teaching experience, um, you know, or you're just thinking about doing it for a year um, to be able to improve your Spanish or to get to travel, things like that. Um, you know, it might not be right for you, but I think um, it's important thing to consider. Um, you know, a lot of feedback that we get from people who teach in Spain um, is that they wish they would have had more training on exactly what the classroom experience is going to be like. So, um, you know, it's a it's an opportunity for you to get to know whether or not TEFL would be right for you. And of course, if you have any questions, um, I'm always available for um, advising sessions with anyone who's interested in learning more um, and helping, you know, make you like, make that decision for, for getting TEFL certified. So um, feel free to reach out at any time. Cool. Okay. So while people are looking at this, I'll just ask some of the questions that are in the chat. We'll probably have about 10 more minutes. Um, but if any of you panelists want to answer these, um, on the weekends, what do you, do you visit other parts of Spain? Do you um, travel? Um, like, what are your, some of your favorite places to go or favorite places you've been? Who wants to answer? I know someone has an answer. <laughs> I can answer. Cool. Um, this is, this is totally a up to you thing. Um, but my personal favorite spot that I've been so far was Edinburgh, Scotland. That was amazing. Um, before I moved to Spain, everyone asked, where's the number one place you want to visit? And it was Edinburgh and it lived up to the hype. Um, but I've actually done more trips within Spain, which has been wonderful. So going up to the north of Spain to see the Basque country. Um, I went to Barcelona and the coast. Um, we also went to Granada with some friends. So Spain is so diverse. I mean, there's so many different languages. There's so many different um, dialects and different cultural backgrounds. It's just absolutely amazing. And so it's also very affordable. So once you leave and go travel outside of Spain, you're going to be like, oh my goodness, Spain is so affordable, um, which is lovely. So I, I mean, you have to take advantage of the fact that we are so close. And I went on a trip to Germany this past week with my friends and we had the realization of like the fact that we would have to plan this from the States is more of a one-time thing and it's really nice to go back to your home in Spain and not be jet lagged. Um, so the weekends definitely depend on what you make it. Um, I personally have Fridays off and it's super cheap to fly on Thursday nights. So I've been going out on Thursday nights and coming back on Sundays and I love it. I can't recommend traveling enough, but also um, teaching is like the most fulfilling part of this job. So um, it's good to have rewarding experiences on the weekend and then kind of go in with that fun energy with your kids and also share the traveling experience as well. Awesome. Great. I can kind of really quick piggyback mm -hmm. off that. 
not to throw in a little self promo, but I'm actually about to post a TikTok about this. Yay. Uh, I was about to, it's just like, this is such a common misconception. Like I, this is apparently like said many times before we arrived, but obviously I just wasn't paying attention that we aren't paid until November 1st. So with that being said, everybody comes here with the intention of traveling on the weekends. And like, it's easy to compare your experience, to, uh, your potential experience to like people you've seen studying abroad. So it's like people studying abroad, you see them going to 13 different countries in the span of four months. And that originally was something I like pictured for myself. But after being faced with the reality of when you get your first paycheck, you quickly change your mind and just traveling with around Spain looks a lot better than jetting off to London and Paris. But I have to say, like at first I was initially a little discouraged about all that, but I'm so fortunate because like Olivia was saying, it forces you to travel around Spain and get to know your own country. And talking to people who have studied abroad before, I feel like the most common thing you hear is they barely spend time in their own city because they were so busy going to other places. So forcing yourself, quote unquote, to take advantage of the cheap travel all around Spain is something to not take for granted because we've been to a bunch of different places within Spain and some of them are my favorite. So that don't expect to necessarily be jetting off every weekend, but it's not a bad thing. Awesome. Great. And I have a um, kind of two other questions that tie into that, but what do you think is a good number to save before you go? Um, like what, what's a good number to bring to Spain and what are some of the unexpected costs, costs that you incurred um, when you moved to Spain? Yeah, I would, I, an unexpected cost we can talk about is the scary life of bed bugs. And, you know, you hear about it everywhere and you don't think it's going to happen. And it never, it didn't happen to us specifically, but um, it happened to our friend. And after paying a two month, uh, two month down deposit, their first month rent, their utilities and everything, and then getting bed bugs, you it's not going to happen to you, but that's just an example of something that is very costly that can come out of nowhere, but that can come from if you're living in the United States at your own home or, or anywhere. So things happen to people all the time, no matter where you are, but when they happen in a foreign country, when you're living on a budget, it does feel like the end of the world. So um, I don't know, I, I guess how much I would say to bring, like to live comfortably, like before you get your first paycheck, I would say 4,000, 5,000, 5,000. If like you're planning on eating out, trying all the hottest spots, like that's what you're going to do. But to pay your first two months rent deposit, your like your deposit, your first month's rent, your phone, your Wi-Fi, your groceries, I would say 4,000 because, and then you will probably be left with some with like left over with some money, but in order to feel safe, secure, and comfortable, I would arrive with at least that to get you um, to your first paycheck with a little bit of cushion. Mm -hmm. And then if you're looking to do some extra traveling to the big fancy spots, like you should, you have to just know yourself and do your research before you come. How much is a flight to where you want to go from Madrid to there and budget that allocated cost into your monthly expenses. I think also um, since Grace said, like we are, we're fortunate enough to find um, housing and living um really early within like a short period of time but sometimes like I know people they some people are still like have been still looking and have looked for like months like a month so it sometimes it, it ranges so you're also paying for the housing of Airbnbs and like hostels while you're waiting to have permanent living so that also adds in on the the saving portion of what you need to bring yeah, there's no definite timeline for that. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me see what other questions. There's a lot of questions. I don't know how much time we have left. Um what luggage did you wish that you brought? Or like, so what what's something you packed that I guess what you wish you brought and that what you wish you didn't bring? We can answer again, but we other people can answer too. But I was just, I have one answer and it's my backpack is my best friend. It's like this big backpack from Amazon that fits on Ryanair. It can fit like 
clothes for a weekend trip and um it could, I bring it to school I bring it everywhere and it's just from Amazon it's like literally Google Amazon carry-on backpack and I think that's what I got <laughs> but that is I can't stress enough because people bring like weekender bags and those kind of can be a waste because they don't count as like personal items on some flights it gets a little tricky so my backpack is my number one recommendation in terms of like packing when you're coming here um what I do wish I really brought here were are more sweatpants and um <laughs> honestly a big sweatshirt yeah. it sounds silly but here I brought like a lot of clothes to wear going out and just to teach and stuff and I am really missing my big sweatshirt and my That's sweatpants awesome. so if you're planning on packing I would say that just for your apartment I would just say just pack a little less because you will go shopping. It's inevitable. <laughs> you will definitely go shopping when you get here because a lot of the clothes is straight fire. So you want to be able to, you want to just pack a little less than what you think you're going to need. And then you're going to think about how if you do a huge luggage, that you're going to be bringing that from the airport to the hotel, to the home, to the home state, and then traveling in with it to your home, so. Um, I have a question here um, for the immersion people that did living with the host family help you get adjusted in the beginning or how did that help with having that experience of the two and four weeks before? I had an amazing experience. Um, we called her Abuela and we still talk to her. She's so lovely. Um, I was with her for four weeks. It gave me, like the graces were saying, sometimes you have to really rush to find an apartment if you are doing just the one week orientation. So I was fortunate enough to have four weeks in a very like safe and happy house um, to find housing. And she gave so many tips, sometimes a little bit silly tips about where to live and why we should live in what neighborhoods. Um, and she was also really helpful with navigating transportation and honestly with talking with landlords like Grace was saying earlier it's really good to get on the phone with them and um I got I have a little bit of Spanish but not enough to navigate a conversation about rent renting an apartment so she was willing to talk to landlords for us which was amazing um and then also just building the connection with them I mean we would have dinner with her and her partner every single night without fail um, and just talk about our days and talk about what we're learning in class. And I learned so much Spanish. I had no Spanish background before. So that's why I wanted to do the immersion program. Um, so yeah, that really helped me get adjusted. Um, and yeah, just one thing I wish I brought is a handheld fan, just to add to that. Because when you first get here, it's really hot. Okay, we have more in the classes. Sorry, the Spanish classes yeah. are amazing. Yeah, too. They definitely take a Spanish class. <laughs> I forgot yeah, about yeah. that. Like the host day, the host day was amazing, but also taking Spanish classes every day for four hours gave you no choice but to figure out the language. And mm -hmm. also, I mean, this school that we work with is amazing. So cool. Um, I think I know the answer to this, but for your phone bills, do you all pay about twenty euros a month? And with a Spanish SIM card? Yes. Yep. 10, 10 euros. 10. 10. 20. Vodafone, oh. baby. But I'm obsessed with okay. <laughs> Cool. 10 to 20 euros, then it sounds like is the average. Cool. It'll it be much cheaper. Yeah. yeah. Don't, I recommend don't use your US phone. Bring, get a no. Spanish SIM card. <laughs> yeah. Easier. Hey, Lauren, you want to skip to the last slide so people can see how yes. to get in touch with us just in case people oh, have perfect. questions? Yeah. And I know there are still more questions, but we do have to wrap it up soon. Um, so you can definitely send us your questions um, at teachinspain at CIEE.org. Um, thank you to the Graces, Cher, Caitlin, and Olivia for chatting with us today. It's nice to see you guys. And thanks to Rachel for always being in presentations with me. <laughs> um, but yeah, definitely send us your questions. Um, but I think for here, I know we did not get to all the questions. I'm sorry if we got to all the questions, we would go on forever and we 
unfortunately cannot do that. Um, but we will definitely respond to everything by email um, or you can schedule a call with us. And thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.